Welcome to all of you for this webinar. Before starting, I would like to present you Dr. Olivier Vicent from Germany. He's a consultant in intensive care medicine, anesthesia and regional anesthesia. And he's very famous for education and training as well. At the University Hospital Carl Gustav Carus in Dresden, that offers medical care at the highest level. I also would like to thank you, to thank our historical partner, Payung, for the organization of this webinar. I would like to remind you that if you have any question, you can use the button, the QA button in the middle of the screen instead of the chat room, and remind you also that it is a recorded session. Have a nice webinar. Okay, thank you for the introduction, Beatrice. And I also thank Payung for the invitation and also Ezra for the opportunity to speak about catheters for continuous regional anesthesia. And I start to share my screen to start my lecture. Okay, I hope everybody is able to see my screen. I guess so, we have checked before. So the topic is catheter techniques for continuous nerve blocks as safe and real, reliable as we believe. Um, first, my conflict of interest. I received payments of uh, for lectures from Pion Medical Products, B. Brown and Synthetica, but that won't influence my talk and not the content about what I'm speaking. Um, first, I want to start with a survey about the quality of postoperative pain treatment in German hospitals. And we see there is an insufficient pain relief in 50% of the cases. Um, we have more intensive pain at night and during mobilization. And usually at night, we have uh, not so many staff on the wards. Um, that's also a reason why many patients do not ask for pain medications, especially at night. Um, furthermore, minor surgery is underestimated in terms of pain and um, of severe pain. And there's an infrequent use of continuous regional anesthesia. So there is some space for improvement. And catheters for continuous regional, an regional anesthesia um, offer some advantages like prolonged improved analgesia, a lower opioid consumption. We have an improved physiotherapy as long if the mode of function is preserved. And that leads to a better quality of sleep, less nausea and vomiting that are usually side effects of the opioid therapy. And finally, we have increased patient satisfaction. But there is also another side of the coin. We have also disadvantages of continuous regional anesthesia. Um, like it's a very time consuming technique. We have higher costs for material and staff. Um, we have to take care of our catheters. That's why we need uh, a 24 hour, seven days pain service. We have also to consider that there are potential complications caused by catheters on the ward. I will speak later on about it. And we have a heterogeneous efficacy in studies. That's also my next slide. Um, we see here a study comparing the liposomal bubibacaine periarticular injection compared with a endoscaline uh, nerve block catheter. And um, while the catheter was administered eight milliliter per hour, Robbie Baca in 0.5%. And we see at the day of surgery, there was a significant difference uh, in terms of pain levels, but already on the first postoperative day, there wasn't a difference anymore. And that was not uh, caused by lower pain levels. We see here the pain level was still high at five. Um, that means that obviously the catheter um, efficacy was decreased on the first postoperative day and also on the second day. Uh, we can see that also 
um, on the opioid usage, we see here on the day of surgery, there was a significant difference between the articular injection and the catheter technique. But on the postoperative day one, there was no difference anymore with a high usage of opioids up to 50, 60 milligram of morphine equivalents. There are also similar results of other studies. Another study I show you um, used a combined saphenous and sciatic nerve block um, with a catheter technique, and they compared it to a placebo. Um, they used a short axis in-plane approach for the catheter techniques with an initial bolus for all patients in both groups. In the intervention group, they used 5 milliliter per hour ropivacaine 0 0.2, and in the placebo group, uh, the same amount of isotonic saline. Um, we see in the beginning at uh, the day of surgery, um, during the first 12 hours, when there was still the action of the single shot, there was no difference between both groups. Uh, we didn't expect this. But after 24 hours, when the single shot had worn off, there was also no difference between the catheter technique and the placebo group um, with um, pain levels at the intervention border, or so in the intervention group, pain level of three, and in the placebo group of four. That doesn't mean um, clinical meaningful difference. Um, we see also that the patients um, used a lot of morphine too um, after the first hours. So that raises the question, could some casitas be dislodged? And yeah, I forgot to um, tell you that I have also some questions to interact a little bit with you. We have now the first question. I want to ask you, how high do you estimate the dislocation rate of peripheral regional anesthesia catheters to be? A, less than 10%, B, 10 up to 20%, C, 20 up to 40%, D, 40 up to 60%, and E, uh, above 60%. And now you have 15 seconds to vote um, your answer or to choose your answer. I will wait for the results. Okay, um, I'm not sure if all of you are able to see the results. That's um, why I will read the results to you. Um, so 6% of you choose answer A, less than 10%. 26% um, um, have chosen 10 up to 20%, 40% have chosen 20 up to 40%, and 23%, 40 up to 60%, and only 4% um, think that the, that the um, dislocation rate is above 60%. I continue. Um, reasons and frequency of regional anesthesia or continuous regional anesthesia failures. Um, the main reason is the uh, initial misplacement of catheters. And in the literature, there is um, a percentage up to 80% reported. Uh, second main course is the secondary catheter migration within the tissue that is, uh, that's reported up to 60%. Um, Less frequently, we find exceeded dislocation at the insertion point that's reported only with 3%. So that's really not a major reason for dislocations. Um, other reasons, I won't speak about it, um, is uh, insufficient local anesthetic dose and the wrong regional anesthesia technique. I want to focus on the topic of misplacements and secondary catheter migrations in the further talk. Um, because of the regional anesthesia failures, 
A continuous regional anesthesia should be always part of a multimodal pain management protocol with a systemic rescue analgesic medication. So the patients don't have to suffer in case of a regional anesthesia failure or catheter failure. Um, to explain uh, misplacement, misplacements of catheters and um, secondary dislodgement or migration of catheters, we should have a look on our techniques, how we place catheters. I think the most popular technique worldwide is the short axis view of our target combined with the in-plane technique. We have a good imaging of the entire needle and also the catheter course can be visualized. Drawbacks or disadvantages of this technique is the catheter enters the nerve in a perpendicular direction. So there is a high risk of overshooting at the target, um, leading to an initial misplacement of the catheter, like the year um, imaged in this picture. I will show you also in this video, we have here the needle, it's the needle tip, and I hope you can see my cursor. It's the region of the popliteal sciatic nerve block. We have here the um, uh, the tibial nerve and the popliteal nerve, um, and the needle is placed between both nerves within the surrounding um, fascia that's surrounding the sciatic nerve. And here we already see the spread of the local anesthetic via or through the needle. And now the catheter is advanced through the needle. And what we can see is an overshooting of the catheter. So the catheter is penetrating the surrounding fascia and is misplaced somewhere in the tissue. Um, Here's the overshooting catheter. That might lead to uh, low efficacy because the local anesthetic spread is far away from our target nerve, like here um, with this white line surrounded. The alternative technique is the short axis view and the out of plane technique. Um, it's less frequently used usually um, a little bit more popular, I think, still in Germany. Um, the advantage of this technique is the catheter thread is intended parallel to the nerve. We have a lower risk in the literature of initial misplacements and a lower rate of catheter migration, of secondary catheter migrations. Uh, drawbacks of this technique is it's a challenge to visualize the needle tip and the catheter. And there is still a likelihood of overshooting with steep needle angles, as I will show you on the next on one of the next slides, or of this uh, on this slide. Um, here we see what we usually intend that we thread the catheter parallel to the nerve, so the catheter follows the course of the nerve, but it can also be the case that um, the catheter um, escape from our target nerve to the left or lateral, uh, to the medial or lateral side in this case. Or um, if we have steeper angles that we don't have this case that the catheter is following the nerve parallel to the nerve, but with steep angles, there is a, a risk that the uh, catheter can also overshoot our target nerve and the local end spread is far away from our target, so with a low efficacy. Uh, I come to the next question. Uh, which insertion technique do you usually, or do you use most frequently um, for peripheral regional anesthesia catheters? You can choose multiple answers. A, mostly the short axis in-plane approach, B, mostly short axis out-of-plane approach, or you use use both um, approaches equally. D, occasionally the long axis in plane and E, occasionally long axis out of plane. Now you can vote and in 15, 20 seconds, I will tell you 
the results. Okay, as expected, um, the majority of you use the short axis in-plane approach, 66% uh, of uh, all participants. Um, the minority use the short axis out-of-plane approach, 15% and 10% say they use both techniques equally. And there is a small number, 16% use occasionally the long axis in-plane approach and less frequently the long axis out of plane approach. So the most of you use the technique with the highest risk of overshooting. Um, what are the consequences of overshoot overshooting? I already told you that we have a lower efficacy because the local anesthetic spread is uh, maybe far away from our target nerve. But apart from a decreased efficacy, we have also safety issues to consider um, mainly um, with blocks um, that are in the paravertebral region, um, like for instance, the endoscaline block. Um, that's our target here the in the, um, between both endoscaline muscles. Um, here we usually want to place the local anesthetic, but in the case of overshooting, the catheter tip can be located much more medially where we find the vagus nerve and the um, ganglion stellatum here. So that the local, anesthet uh, local anesthetic spread here might cause side effects like uh, hoarseness and the Horner syndrome that we usually, or that we sometimes see in our patients. Um, but the uh, catheter can also enter the neuroforamen and penetrate the dura and uh, so a misplacement in the in the intrathecal space can also happen as a severe complication or serious complication um a german group summarized um seven cases of um severe catheter related complications um, while placing endoscaline catheters. Um, these catheters were malpositioned five times in the intrathecal space, two times uh, in the vessel. Um, two of these patients died. So one of the intrathecally misplaced catheters uh, died and one patient of the, of the intravascular uh, misplaced catheters died. Um, they found the usual symptoms of local anesthetic systemic toxicity with cardiac arrest, uh, unconsciousness, apnea, hypotension, but also one patient presented without any symptoms, um, which um, catheter techniques we have chosen, um, three times the Winnie approach, one time the approach according to Mark two times it was a ultrasound guided approach and uh, in one case it was not reported which catheter types were used um, in one case it was unknown in three um, three times the contiplex cannula and catheter system of the brown was taken and three times the plexolong catheter of payung was taken uh, interestingly um, in three times the test aspiration was negative only in three um, cases the test aspiration was positive for blood or cerebrospinal fluid uh, we have to see here there in no case was an ultrasound guided control also interestingly uh, when happened um, the severe complications three times in the operating room two times in the recovery room but also two times on the ward Um, it's a well-known problem. Um, in this study, a uh, group from Switzerland investigated paravertebral catheters in human cadavers. And 
they found a very, very high misplacement rate. Uh, the catheters or the needle was placed ultrasound guided. The catheters were advanced blindly thereafter, and they investigated the catheter location by um, CT scan and found a high misplacement rate of the catheters of the catheter tip in up to 80 percent. And we see here the locations of the catheter. The, um, location two is the correct space where we want to place the catheter. But in all the other locations, the catheters could be found also in the, in the entire fecal space. Um, this is well known also for the psoas compartment blocks. That's also a paravertebral block. Um, there's also the risk of epidural and spinal catheter misplacements uh, leading to a zero complication. Um, our catheters can penetrate not only the um, medulla, leading to an intrathecal misplacement, they can also penetrate the pleura of the lung, leading to an interpleural migration of um, a catheter like in this case, uh, in the scalene catheter that was eight centimeters advanced through the needle. And we see here the spread of the fluid of the contrast, contrast dye um, in the interpleural space. I come to question three, which catheter techniques do you use? Here also multiple answers are possible. Do you use a catheter through needle technique with a metal stylet, or you use the catheter through needle technique, um, or uh, sorry, A is without a metal stylet, B is with metal stylet, C, you use a catheter through needle technique with a curl catheter, D, a catheter over needle technique, and E, you don't use catheter techniques. Now there are, again, 20 seconds to vote. Okay, one, almost one third of you uh, use the catheter through needle technique without a metal stylet. That is, for instance, the Condiplex uh, catheter set of B. Brown. Um, also, one third use the catheter through needle technique with metal stylet. For instance, the Sono Long Sono set of Payung. Um, only 10% use the catheter through needle technique with a curl catheter and 17% use the catheter over needle technique and 20 or one quarter uh, say, I don't use catheter techniques at all. I continue. Um, I just want to show you this video um, to yeah, to show you how stiff our catheters actually are. Um, we see here the brown contiplex. It's an, a catheter without a metal stylet. And if the catheter is advanced through the needle, the catheter easily penetrate the skin of this tomato here. And with the metal stylet, the catheter is much more stiff than without. And we see also here the catheter easily penetrate the tomato skin. Um, this both examples are with a facet tip, but also a toy tip can't prevent the catheter from penetrating the tomato skin. So I just show you this um, videos to make clear that our catheters that we usually use are very stiff and with a sharp tip that easily penetrate a fascia that comes along if we overshoot our catheters.
And well, if you say, okay, maybe that was a very mature tomato, so it's not a surprise that the catheter uh, can penetrate the skin. I show you another video here. That's a plastic bag to produce ice cubes. And I advanced the catheter inside a plastic bag. And you see while threading the catheter further, it easily penetrates also the thick plastic wall of this plastic bag. So I think that makes clear that our catheters that we use easily penetrate also several tissues uh, surrounding our uh, the nerves of our patients where we place our catheters that might cause problems and severe complications as I have shown you. So the main or important question is if we place or after we have placed the catheter, we should know where our catheters are located to prevent complications. Um, that's very important in my opinion. So the next question to you is how frequently do you verify the catheter position after initial placement? A, you always verify the, the catheter position. It's a standard care protocol in the hospital. B, you do it frequently, but it's not a standardized protocol. C, you do it sometimes, D, rarely, just in case of difficulties or complications, and E, you never check your catheter. So, really curious. Okay, congratulations. Almost half of you always uh, check the catheter position after the initial placement. So um, I think that's very important to avoid complications and to ensure uh, a good efficacy of the continuous infusion thereafter. 31% um, uh, say they use it frequently, but it's not a standardized protocol. And only 6% use it sometimes, 11% rarely, and only 4% never control their catheter location after the initial placement. Next question I want to add is, how do you usually check the catheter position? Um, your image ultrasound guided directly the catheter, or you use the ultrasound guided imaging of local anesthetic or saline spread via the catheter. C, ultrasound guided imaging of injected air. D, you do an X-ray to check the catheter, or E, you use uh, stimulating catheters to check the position. Okay, um, one quarter of you use the direct ultrasound guided visualization of the catheters. Um, I'm very happy to read um, that 64% of you use the local anesthetic or saline spread via the catheter to verify the catheter position. Um, yeah, as expected, only a few of you, 4% um, use injected air, 3% use the X-ray, and 5% still use stimulating catheters. Um, our catheters that we nowadays use are usually echogenic, so we have a good echogenicity of our catheters, we can visualize the catheter in the tissue. You see here the double line of the catheter, here our target nerve, the sciatic nerve in the popliteal region. But um, in my experience, 
it's not always possible to define the needle tip exactly since the catheter is not always in alignment with the ultrasound beam like the much more stiff needle was during the insertion of the needle. Um, so, um, yeah, the tip is not always to define, especially with multi orifice catheters. Uh, it's not always clear where the orifices are in respect to the nerve. Um, that's why, in my opinion, the gold standard is the visualization of fluid spread via the catheter. Either you use saline or local anesthetic. And if necessary, you can also add the use of color Doppler sonography um, to visualize the fluid spread in the tissue. We see here an example in the Indoscaline region. Here was the catheter imaged, and now we see the local anesthetic spread uh, between the upper and lower, uh, the upper and middle trunk here in the between the Indoscaline muscles. Um, so um, that's a very good verification of the local anesthetic spread that is here surrounding our target structures. Another example here for the sciatic nerve block. We see here the local anesthetic spread surrounding our two target nerves, the sciatic nerve that is surrounded by uh, a fascia here. And the local anesthetic spread is within this uh, fascial space surrounding both nerves. Um, it's an important information to see uh, the local anesthetic spread also in the case of overshooting. Like in this example, we see here uh, in this picture from a publication of Ilfeld, uh, overshooted catheter. And also here in this um, ultrasound video, we see the local anesthetic spread far away from our target nerve. It's again here, the sciatic nerve in the popliteal fossa. And Obviously, this local anesthetic spread uh, won't reach um, our sciatic nerve. So we expect with this local anesthetic spread, a low efficacy of our continuous block. That means that the catheter has to be retracted. Um, we see it here now in the video, the withdrawal of the catheter until the local anesthetic spread is in the correct space here. Uh, the video is running once again. And now there's the injection here in the correct target space um, surrounding both parts of the sciatic nerve. And we see here also in this picture, uh, the catheter location after the catheter retraction in the correct space. The, the drawback of this technique to withdraw the catheter is that the catheter thereafter, after the retraction, is or uh, remain in the target space only one or see, uh, two centimeters. So, and the short advancement of the catheters, either by initial placement or after withdrawal, also create some problems because we might have an increased migration rate. Um, I give you two examples here for the sciatic nerve block and for the endoscaline block. Uh, we have a lot of movements of muscles and active and passive mobilization of the patients. So we have a lot of movements of the tissue. So the catheter might be retracted further uh, during uh, mobilization of the patient. Um, that might cause migrations within the tissue, not at the insertion site at the skin, but within the tissue. So the catheter thereafter is not um, inside our target space anymore. So escape from our target space, that might lead also to a decreased efficacy of our continuous infusion. And in this example here, the Indoscaline catheter also uh, is um, dislodged. 
and now located between the deep and the superficial cervical fascia, but not between the endoscalae muscles like intended. So also here, we expect a decreased efficacy of the continuous infusion. Um, but um, the catheter migration might lead not only to a lower efficacy, but can also cause um, serious complication, uh, like in this case or this example that I want to show you. We have here, the exa for example, the costoclavicular block, block um, the advanced catheter with the correct uh, catheter tip position between the uh, fascicles of the brachial plexus uh, surrounded by a fascia um, with the correct spread of the local anesthetic. What might happen after movements of the patients and uh, tissue movement, muscle movement, that the catheter also is retracted. And if the catheter is placed through a vessel, the catheter openings might be located after the migration inside the vessel. So we have uh, intravascular spread of the local anesthetic with the consequence of a local uh, systemic uh, toxicity. A local anesthetic, uh, systemic local anesthetic uh, toxicity. Um, I show you a video where uh, we can see the migration happened in the endoscalene region. So here we have the endoscalene region, and you saw, I show you once again, the local anesthetic spread, like in the example before, is between the superficial and deep cervical fascia more medially here and not in our target area that we usually um, address between the two endoscalene muscles. Another example for the sciatic nerve block. Here is the catheter migrated laterally. Here's our target nerve, the sciatic nerve, and we see here a part of the catheter, and I go back and again and show you the local anesthetic spread that is far away from our target nerve with a low efficacy. Um, there are only a few studies addressing catheter migration after uh, correct initial placement. Uh, one of the first studies was from an Austrian group um, of Peter Marhofer. Um, they investigated 20 volunteers. Uh, they placed femoral nerve blocks and endoscaline nerve blocks in a, a short axis view and out of plane approach. They advanced the catheter three centimeters. Um, verified by ultrasound with saline injection. Um, then they had a six hours follow up with compulsory and optional movements um, of the volunteers. And thereafter they verified the catheter location again um, by ultrasound and fluid injection. And they found a recreation rate 20% um, um, for the femoral nerve block and in 5% for the endoscaline nerve block. Um, interestingly, all catheters were still in place at the insertion site, as you can see here. So there was no migration at the insertion site at the skin. So all the migrations happened within the tissue by the movements that the volunteers had done. Um, that was a study in volunteers. Um, in reality, uh, in our patients, catheter tip migration might happen much more often. And I think it's underestimated and often undetected because um, we saw yeah, 50% of us um, verify the catheter location. That means that also, or still a lot of our colleagues don't verify the catheter location, not after the first placement and also not later if we have the suspect of a catheter tip migration. 
Um, but there are a few studies reporting casseter migrations, um, and this reported uh, casseter migration rates are very high, in my opinion. So up to 70% for the short axis in-plane approach for the adductor canal block, 40% for the short axis in-plane approach for the popliteal sciatic nerve block in this publication of Howritz. 60% uh, in a publication for the popliteal sci sciatic nerve block um, in a publication of our um, hospital. And there's another study from a group from Borum, 50% with the short axis out of plane approach for the endoscaline block. So um, that means a lot of our patients are at risk of an insufficient uh, continuous infusion of local anesthetic. Interestingly, the majority of tip migrations already occur, occur on the day of surgery. Um, so now we know the problems and we have to solve it, but the genius tried to prevent the problem. Um, so how we maybe can prevent the primary misplacement and the secondary uh, catheter migration. And I think one solution can be to use self-curling uh, or coiling catheters like the sonar long curl sonar catheter that can be at once two up to three centimeters and is self coiling up uh, within our target space. Um, or a new catheter by Payong, it's a sonar long soft secure catheter that I want to introduce um, that can be advanced five up to five centimeters, uh, four up to five centimeters um, beyond the needle tip. And this catheter is not self-coiling uh, with a um, um, predetermined radius like the curl catheter. So here we have a predetermined radius of the first two, three centimeters of the catheter. This catheter is very soft at the first five centimeters. So this catheter can also curl up, but not with a pre defined or predetermined uh, radius. So with this self curling catheters or curling catheters, we can prevent overshooting because these catheters don't penetrate easily the surrounding um, connective tissue. Um, this is the Self-curling catheter, the curl catheter, we have six lateral openings over the um, first two centimeters. Um, this catheter is self-curling with a predetermined radius. Um, there are some studies that could show a better placement of this catheters with a reduced um, rate of malpositions. This is a study once again by the same group from Switzerland. Um, they investigated again 10 uh, cadavers with um, 40 popliteal cytic nerve blocks. They used this short axis implant approach, advanced the catheter three centimeters, and the catheter location was verified by CT scan and MRI. And they found in 39 out of 40 cases, a proper spread of the contrast dye with direct nerve contact. So only one out of 40 cases um, was misplaced. And they did another study um, also in 10 cadavers for the paravertebral um, technique. They used a the transversal few um, ultrasound guided with combined with the uh, in-plane approach. They advanced the catheter three centimeters and the catheter location was again verified by CT scan. And in contrast to the former study that I had shown you, that I showed you some slices uh, before, in contrast, they found a uh, um, decreased um, a decreased um, rate of malpositions. Um, they, in this case, they found no misplacements of the curl catheters. In all cases, they found a proper spread of the contrast dye. Um, only in 
percent. It was not easy to thread the catheter in the first attempt uh, beyond the needle tip. And that happens also in my experience uh, in the daily life using the 100 millimeter cannula um, with the curl, self curling catheter, that it's sometimes a challenge to thread the catheter um, to advance the catheter through this long needle. Um, we also um, have undertaken a study to investigate the curl catheter um, for the popularly Popolithial sciatic nerve block, it was combined with a saphenous uh, nerve block as a single shot. And we uh, compared the self-coiling catheter with a standard catheter. Um, we found a very low misplacement rate and um, very low secondary migration rate for the curl catheter that are the white boxes here. And as reported before, a very high secondary dislocation rate for the standard catheters was on the operating day. Uh, we found already um, um, dislodgement rate of almost 30%, and that was increasing on the first post-operative post day up to 50, and on the second day to 60%. Um, that had had consequences for the pain therapy. We found uh, higher pain levels in case of dislocated catheters compared to these catheters which were still in place. There's another study from a um, group in Borum in Germany who found similar results uh, for the endoscaline Regal plexus block with the curl catheter compared with a, a normal stimulon sono catheter that has the metal stylet. The second catheter I want to introduce to prevent malpositions and secondary dislodgement is a new catheter. It's called Sonolong Soft Secure Catheter. Uh, this catheter has also six openings. Uh, over the first two centimeters. And um, this catheter has a new material. It's polyuretane instead of polyacetylene that provides or improves the catheter flexibility. Um, as I said right now, catheter has a closed tip and six lateral openings. The catheter has a stainless steel helical coil to prevent uh, the catheters from kinking. Uh, the catheter has also a metal or steel stylet, but this steel uh, stylet ends five centimeters before the needle tip. So we have a stiff part of the catheter to improve stability while threading the catheter through the needle. And we have the first five centimeters that are very soft to allow the catheter to coil up at the target space and to avoid penetrations of the surrounding tissue. There is another uh, catheter that is also provided uh, with a soft tip. That's the Aerotailoflex catheter, the flex block catheters that this catheter was uh, initially um, developed for the epidural, um, um, catheter, uh, epidural technique, but you can also use this catheter for the peripheral nerve blocks. Um, compared to the normal sonolong sono echo and also to the sonolong curl catheter, you see that the sonolong soft secure catheter is curling up with a very small radius. So it's possible to place this catheter also in very small target spaces, like for instance, the paravertical space. And so you remember the videos with the tomato and our stiff catheters and this example I did again with the soft secure catheter and here you see the catheter is not penetrating the tomato um, and start to curl up as soon as the catheter hit the skin of the tomato. 
And also the example is the plastic bag. You see the catheter is not penetrating the plastic wall, is curling up in this chamber here of the plastic bag for the ice cubes. And that means uh, increased safety in the tissue of our patients if there are uh, structures that are of risk to be punctured like uh, vessels or the pleura or the dura. Here we see the advancement of the soft secure catheter in the tissue. In the video, the catheter is curling up around the sciatic nerve and not penetrating and not overshooting. So we decrease the misplacement, the initial misplacement, and we can also visualize the catheter and spread through the catheter. Um, we evaluated also the soft tissue cure catheter in a first study. Uh, we investigated 90 patients. Uh, it was a single center randomized controlled trial with two groups. In one group, we advanced the solar lung soft secure catheter and the other group, the solar lung sonar catheter. That's the catheter with the metal stylet. Uh, that's not self-curling or curling. Um, and we um, used a short axis in-plane approach for the sciatic nerve block. We injected as a bolus 20 mil of pilocaine, 1.5%. And um, thereafter, we used 6 mil per hour, roughly what I in 0.2% uh, in both groups. Additionally, we... Uh, um, did a saphenous nerve block with 10 mil of in 0.5, but without a catheter. The primary outcome was the dislocation rate um, by, so um, evaluated by imaging uh, the fluid spread, and the secondary outcome was the quality of pain relief. Um, we distinguished five catheter positions. A is no dislocation, so the local anesthetic spread was surrounding the sciatic nerve within the fascia surrounding the nerve. Um, a light dislocation was seen if the local anesthetic spread was outside this fascia, but still uh, reaching the nerve. And in the case C, the local anesthetic spread far away from our um, target nerve. So here are the preliminary results. Um, for the solo long soft secure catheter, we found a significant lower dislocation rate. Um, if we take the light dislocation, so the local anesthetic was still near the target nerve, we found a dislocation rate up to 10% on the day of surgery. But uh, the solo long sonar catheter with the metal stylet was already dislodged in up to 60%. On the first day, uh, it was almost the same result. Um, the much um, more significant dislocations without any contact of the local anesthetic to the nerve, uh, we found the dislocations for the subcure catheter on the day of surgery in 4%. Uh, for the sonar long sonar catheter, a little bit over 20% and that increased to 50% on the first postoperative day. And there was still a very low uh, migration rate for the subsecure catheter in 8%. That resulted in an improved pain therapy on the day of surgery. There was a significant difference um, in terms of pain levels. Unfortunately, we were not able to show that on the first postoperative day. I think that was um, due to the saphenous nerve block. The single shot has worn off on the first postoperative day. So a lot of these patients suffered pain on the medial side of the angle. Um, um, but we found, oh, sorry, um, also a difference um, for the pain at movement. With the subsecure catheter, a uh, uh, much higher proportion of the patients with the subsecure catheter had pain levels below three. And um, 
a low rate of pain levels between three and six and above six with the sono long sono catheter a uh, higher rate of patients had higher levels of pain that uh, needed further intervention. I want to summarize my talk. Catheter failures occur more often than assumed. Most important causes are catheter malpositions or migrations within the tissue. Stiff catheters increase the rate of complications and malpositions. Um, soft or curl catheters may reduce the rate of dislocations and complications. Catheter position should always be verified by sonography. And we should use our catheters um, with a multimodal pain management concept. It's very important in case of catheter failures. I thank you for your attention and ask you kindly to write your questions using the Q&A function. Thank you very much. So thank you very much. So Beatrice. We have some question. <laughs> we have. Uh, I can't hear yeah. you. You can hear me? Yes, now. Okay. I have some question, yes. For example, I have a question from Christian Berjek. The soft secure catheter, catheter, does it have a stylet that you must retract before connected to the pump? Yes. Um, so the soft secure catheter has inside the metal stylet while you advance the catheter. Once the catheter is um, placed, you remove the needle. And by removing the needle, you also retract the metal stylet. So when you connect the pump, there is no metal stylet. OK, perfect. Thank you. I have another question um, from Ahmed. Uh, does the use of cate no, this uh, no, sorry. Dimitrios Donsopoulos, with self curling catheters, what about forming knots? Um, for the curl catheter that has a um, predetermined radius, I think risk is zero. Um, for the soft secure catheter, um, I think there is maybe a small risk because we advanced the catheter five, four centimeters, but up to now. Um, so we used the catheter in the last months, I think around 200 times. Uh, we never saw a problem with knotting. We never saw hooking the nerve. Um, so we didn't experience any problems. And also after two, three days, um, when we removed the catheter, um, there was no problem by removing the catheter. So it was very soft when you when we removed the catheter and yeah, without seeing any knots and yeah. Thank you. We I I go to the other one to another one. Which from Lina's catheteris, which catheter fixation technique? would you recommend to reduce migration or dislocation? Okay. Um, as I has shown you, the, um, the problem of catheter migration or retraction at the site of insertion at the skin, this rate is very low. So it's reported with 3%. And we know, we all know the, the problem of leakage that, uh, especially if we need, uh, if, if we use the catheter through needle technique, um, that this leakage might lead to a higher dislocation rate at the insertion site. But actually, I think that's an overestimated problem. Um, we see it in my hospital very rarely. And also, if you look at the studies about uh, the catheter over the needle techniques, uh, they could show in these studies that there is a reduced rate of uh, leakage, but no difference uh, in terms of dislocation rates. And 
So to answer the question, we have two techniques in my hospital. So we use um, um, a fixation system um, by the brand Wigong um, to fix the, the catheter, or I use just stereo stripes and um, uh, transparent covering. Um, I wouldn't recommend sutures and we also don't use the skin glue to fix cassages. Um, furthermore, there is, to my knowledge, no study um, showing any difference for um, different uh, fixation techniques. So I think that's not the important issue. Thank you. I have another question from an Italian. <laughs> so. <laughs> Enrico Zenati, with self-curling catheter, is there the risk of entrapping the nerve roots? Thanks a lot, Enrico Zenati. Um, so far, so in the literature, there is no case that I know um, of uh, hooking the nerve uh, by a self-curling -curl catheter. Um, so I, I know no case. Thank you. Let's go but for the last one, Timothy. A question from Timothy. Thank you for the nice presentation. What's your opinion on repeating single short blocks versus catheter-based catheter technique? Um, it depends on um, your hospital and also the abilities of your stuff um so for us if we intend to prolong the um, analgesia beyond 24 hours then we use catheters in my hospital um, because we just connected with a pump and um, usually we use pumps with a um, continuous um, injection plus a patient controlled bolus. And yeah, but if you, you are able to repeat single shots, then you also can do that. But uh, for us, it's um, not convenient because you always have to go again to the patient to, um, yeah, to perform again the block. It's very time consuming and yeah, I think me, it's more convincing to place a catheter that also um, needs the pain service thereafter, but uh, I think it's less work with the catheter than to repeat a single shot. Thank you. And the last so the one. more you, again, if you repeat a single shot, you have again all the risk that you um, have with any original anesthesia. So you have to advance again the needle, with the risk of uh, damaging the nerve uh, to cause a nerve um, damage. And I think uh, that's lower if you insert a catheter and yeah, use the continuous infusion. Okay. Well, the, last, the last question, if catheter break during the procedure, how do you manage? Uh, unfortunately, we had this case several months ago. Um, so yeah, everybody know that you never should retract the catheter while the needle is still in place. <laughs> but yeah, I think sooner or later it can happen every, everywhere. And so the management depends. Um, so in the case I'm speaking about uh, that happened in in our hospital recently um we just uh though the 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 small part of the catheter that remained in the tissue we didn't touch it um so that the, this piece that was um um happening during a supraclavicular uh, brachial plexus block and um so this remaining piece uh, didn't cause any trouble. So the patient didn't have pain, didn't have any neurological symptoms. 
So we decided the risk to take out this piece uh, is higher to damage uh, neural structures. And so we just decided uh, that this piece remain in the tissue and we um, asked the patient or we told the patient um, to tell us if there are, um, are any neurological problems um, in the further course. Uh, but as long as there is no pain, no, um, no um, neurological complication, I would leave the uh, piece in the tissue. But it depends also on the location, how easily you can uh, locate the remaining piece and uh, how easily you can take it out um, or our surgeons can take it out. So that's also uh, contribute to the decision. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. There are no questions anymore. Yes, there are other questions, but I will say that we can do the last one. Um, did you use thirty milliliter milliliters of LB for interscalene block? Is that uh, allowed and risk for phrenic nerve block with thirty millimeters? Uh, sorry, once again. Did you because... use thirty milli 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 ml? Of no. LB yeah. for interscalene block, is no. that allowed and risk for phrenic nerve block with 30 milli milliliters? I I think this question um, refers to the one publication I have shown in the beginning. Um, that yeah. was the 30 mil of booby, uh, liposomal bubiocaine wasn't injected um, in the endoscaline region. It was a periarticular injection, um, not an endoscaline block. So, and we use for the endoscaline block five up to 10 milliliters of robibacaine 0.5. I wouldn't use 30 mil for the endoscaline block. Okay. Okay. We can Perfect stop question. here. Thank you very much. Because it was wonderful. I have a lot of compliments also for the presentation and for the nice work. Okay, then we close the lecture, I think. Yes. Yes, we can close the lecture. Uh, if there are other questions, I will send it to you and you can maybe answer by email because yeah yeah i i also wrote my email here on the last okay. slide and so if you have further questions yeah then just contact me yeah i will send it to you and you will have the email of the person okay okay thank you, thank you a lot again for the invitation and yeah for the nice webinar and um, uh, possibility to speak hello to everybody have a nice evening to all of you i don't know you are from all the part of the world so maybe it's the day it's the evening so a nice evening a nice day to everybody and, yeah. and thank you very much again yeah. thank you as well and have a nice evening